for a whole generation, um, they defined themselves in many ways by talking about where they were when President John F. Kennedy was shot. And then those of us over the last 15 years who were old enough to remember it, we would often talk about where we were when the two towers fell in New York. And unfortunately, I think today we're marking a tragedy where we will, those of us that are here and love this city, never forget where we were when we heard about the mass shootings in our beloved city. Some of you were at home, some of you were at work, some of you were in the car, uh, some of you found out when you turned on TV or when you looked on social media. Uh, I was at home uh, lying in bed in the early, early hours of Monday morning and I kept hearing a ping of text messages but I had my volume turned down so low that it didn't catch me immediately and eventually I reached over and grabbed my phone and I don't know how many messages I had because I only read about the first two and that's sort of all I remember. And after that, I grabbed my wife's arm and I just said, Lori, something terrible is happening in our city. And we turned on the television to the news and began to watch it unfold. And you know, the central team I'm very proud of just mobilized right into action as well as so many in our city to show love and so support. We, we've seen unspeakable, horrific, stupid and senseless evil this week. And yet we've also seen some of the absolute best of humanity this week as well. Um, the stories are just unbelievable. I know that we've heard them all week long of just people who uh, carried other individuals who were injured, people who laid on top of individuals to shield them and protect them while bullets were being filed, fired, strangers who held the hand of other strangers as they took their last breath, uh, one who even promised that she would call his mom and got the phone and notified his mom about what had happened. I mean, just unthinkable things that people have gone through. Um, Certainly uh, the, the medical professional who was shot in the hand, who wrapped her hand and continued to do triage on individuals in the middle of that uh, moment. Uh, you know, the guy who stole a service vehicle. <laughs> and if there's ever a time to steal a service vehicle, it's all good, right? And went back and started picking people up and taking them. The stories from the hospitals, just unbelievable the amount of Pizza Hut cars and Papa John's cars and Uber vehicles and taxis and random strangers driving down the street who stopped and picked people up who were hurting and took them to the hospital, dropping people off uh, the medical teams. Oh my gosh, I, I prayed last night with uh, one of the uh, members of the trauma unit. And she said, Judd, I've, I've been going since this happened, she said, this was last night, she said, Sunday's my first day off. And she said, I came to church because I'm honestly afraid. She said, I'm afraid of waking up tomorrow morning, not going to work and starting to process all that I've seen. And she began to describe to me some of what she's seen and endured over the last week. And it's gonna be a journey. Thankful for all of our doctors and medical personnel. Thankful for our police officers. Wow. Um, so you see so much of the imagery and the videos of people running away from danger. It was always interesting to me. And then you see uniformed individuals and then non-uniformed police officers who after the first bullet was fired became on duty police officers moving towards the danger while everybody else is running away. And you see them protecting and shielding and doing what they could, forming up in their own tactical teams, moving towards Mandalay Bay, uh, amazing response times. You know, 11 to 12 minutes, you've got a security guard on the 32nd floor of Mandalay Bay, uh, fire, you know, the, the gunman in the room, firing at them. And what, what's remarkable to me, not only there's that, but it's also remarkable to me that the police department were there. Within 60 seconds of him being shot, they were there. I love what the sheriff said. He said, look, if the security guard who did save a tremendous amount of lives, if he didn't save a lot of lives, the police were there in 60 seconds. Then they would have done the same thing. 
That's remarkable response time when you think of it. Come on, we live in this city. How long does it take to get from the lobby to the top of Mandalay Bay, right? Just on a normal day. I don't know, it takes me more than 10 minutes because I'm always waiting around like, come on. Amazing, you know, it's just amazing how fast people mobilized into action in a situation that was, that had never happened before. That, that you know, we were just, we're all in shock by it. Unbelievable. And, um, we're thankful for those officers. I met yesterday with uh, Veronica Hartfield uh, and her family. Uh, Veronica's husband, Charleston Hartfield, was the one Metro Police officer who didn't make it out of the, uh, of the concert venue alive. She was there at the concert with her husband. They were a part of the Central family and we'll be doing a memorial service for, uh, for Charleston Hartfield and, and for that family. But I sat with them yesterday and she said uh, they were going through his computer and they came across a file and the file was titled Charleston Hartfield's Memorial Service. And he's 34 years old. But this is where our, our police officers live, right? He created this file over a year ago. And so she said, do you want to read it? And I said, well, yeah, I'd be honored to read it. So, it's two pages, I read through the whole thing, I was sort of left speechless, but, but I opened up the document and it said, if you're reading this, it's to his wife, I've gone home. And he says, there's no words that'll make it right, so here's the facts. I want this song sung at my funeral and this song sung at my funeral. He said, I don't want black ties and I don't want black being worn because you know, that's mourning, and he says, we're going to celebrate my life and celebrate, uh, you know, who I was. He said, uh, he said, he says, I don't want everybody to get up and talk about what a great guy he was. He goes, I want the truth. If I was great, he said, say it. If I was, bleep, say that, you know? And I just loved his honesty. And then he began to give his wife instruction. Here's what to do with insurance money, should you receive any. Uh, here's what to do over the next several days and weeks with our children. Uh, they've been restoring an old Mustang. Here's what color I want you to paint the Mustang. <laughs> Big, bright, shiny color. He gave her a couple options. <laughs> you know, you read that and you realize how thankful we should be for our police officers who serve and protect. That was created over a year ago. Because you never know. And you better bet we're going to honor his wishes in his memorial service uh, coming up in, a, in almost a couple weeks. So, But it just reminded me of what our officers go through. We're grateful for them. Look, we've all been through something this week. We've been through something traumatic, whether you were at the venue or not. And... So over the next several weeks, we're gonna go on a journey together about how you grieve it and how you start to kind of move forward in this process. Here's what I know. If you don't go through the hurt, you can get lost in the hurt. If you don't go through the hurt, you can get lost in the hurt. And so I wanna to talk to you about how we can go through the hurt so that we can come out on the other side stronger. Psalm 23, uh, one of the most famous sections of the entire Bible, one of the most famous Psalms of the Bible. Let me start in verse four. Here's what David writes. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, you see this? Even when I walk through the darkest valley, and we've walked through a dark valley this past week, he says, I will not be afraid. Why? For you are close beside me. It's God's presence that gives him the courage to keep moving forward even in the darkest valley. So, so how do we walk through this dark valley? Well, first we walk through the hurt. We walk through the hurt. Now David begins Psalm 23 by saying, the Lord is my shepherd. And we often in our society kind of forget how significant this is that the Bible calls us sheep and God the shepherd. Because we don't really live around sheep much and we don't have interaction with them anymore. But let's just say this isn't a compliment when we're called sheep. Uh, Sheep are notorious creatures of habit. 
A sheep will follow in a straight line until that line becomes a rut and they'll keep walking in the rut until it becomes almost unmanageable with nobody ever thinking, step to the right, right? Sheep will uh, eat on a hillside and they'll eat until it basically becomes a desert wasteland rather than spreading the grazing around. They just sort of eat what's in front of them until there's nothing left. They will pollute the ground and go to the restroom and other things and stay in that area until it becomes diseased and, and uh, sheep need a shepherd. If a sheep goes off a cliff, what happens? The other sheep, if they're in a herd, they just follow that sheep right off the cliff edge. You would think at some point a sheep would stop and go, you know guys, Bob went over the edge. <laughs> and we never saw Bob come back again, you know, and then Sue went over the edge, and then no Sue, and like you would think at some point the sheep would stop and say, let's just think about this, but, but they don't. And so the Bible says again and again, David acknowledges it in Psalm 23 as a shepherd. He says, look, the Lord is our shepherd, which means we are the sheep, which means we need a shepherd. We need a guide. We need spiritual comfort. We don't need to navigate this terrain of this hurt on our own. And God can be that guide for us. Will allow him. Psalm 23, verse 1. Look at what he says. The Lord is my shepherd. My challenge to you today in the midst of this tragedy is make sure the Lord is your shepherd. He's the one guiding and leading you. Here's what he says. He says, I have all that I need. He says, He lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams. He renews my strength. He guides me along right paths, bringing honor to his name. Let the Lord be your shepherd today. Let him guide you along right paths. Let him renew your strength. Now to get through it, we're gonna have to go through it, and that's the process. So I wanna to talk to you about some of the stages of grief briefly, because depending on how directly involved you were in this crisis, that's gonna have an effect on how intensely you feel some of these different emotions. But look, even if you weren't there, You've been through something, just watching this on the news, talking to friends and family, and seeing what it's done in our community. And so don't be surprised if some of these emotions and feelings don't strike you. What I'm about to go through is not chronological. It's not like there's an absolute order to this. Everybody's different. You may have some of these stages. You may not experience others. Everybody handles it different. But what I want to flag up to you is just realize some of the things you may be feeling this week, next week, are actually stages of grief. Some of you think, I'm not even going to go through grief, but you are. And so here they are. first one is just shock. You know, shock. And this basically shows up in just people being numb, not feeling anything, not even sure what to feel, feeling bad about the fact that they don't feel anything. Well, there's, there's no rules here. Some people are still in shock over this whole thing. Another stage of grief is denial. Denial is where you just either subconsciously or consciously, you just... You know, you're like, this just didn't happen. You just try to act like it didn't happen. You just try to bury it like it never occurred. It's a stage of grief. Uh, anger is another one. A anybody been angry yet? Yeah. Yeah, if you haven't been, you probably will be. Right? At some point, you're going to get angry. Don't be surprised. We've seen a tremendous outpouring of love in our city and kindness and compassion. Just don't be surprised if we also start to see some anger. It may be directed at you from a family member or a friend or out on the freeway. But that, you know what that is fundamentally? That's somebody trying to process grief. We're trying to process some of what we've been through and there may be some anger. And if it is, just realize it's coming from a certain place for a certain reason. It's part of the process. Anger isn't bad in and of itself. That's how we process and handle it. Bargaining. Bargaining is where, you know, you basically start to imagine how your life would be different without this incident that you've been through, or you start to kind of uh, uh, second guess every decision you've made. If you were at that concert, you think, man, you know, if, maybe if I just would have done this, or just would have gone out of town, or just would have not gone to that event, or if I just wouldn't have hung out on Sunday night and been there at that event, if I wouldn't have let my daughter go or my son go, you can get into survivor's guilt. A lot of people have survivor's guilt right now. It's this just feeling like, 
I've talked to many people who say, I shouldn't have ran. You know, the gun, the gunfire went off, and I ran, and I shouldn't have ran. Let me just say something to you as your pastor. It is perfectly acceptable that when gunfire was falling all around you, you ran for your life. It is perfectly acceptable. In fact, that's what the police were telling you to do. That's what everybody was telling you to do. Get down and get out. And you cannot, I just can put my arm around people more than you would imagine, right? This week going, hey, look, this isn't your fault. You didn't create this. You, you're not responsible for the fact that this happened and the fact that you did what you were being told to do and what every instinct in your body told you to do is, is that does not make you wrong. So just take a breath and let it go and let God have it. But all, all of that is part of the bargaining that we go through. Eventually, we're going to get to sadness. Some of you have already been there. You've felt it really intensely. Um, now, I will tell you, uh, I've been running on adrenaline all week trying to serve individuals, victims, community. And it didn't really hit me until Friday. I'll just be honest with you, like Friday, I was just so incredibly sad. Just sad. I mean, you just think about the loss and the lives and the people impacted and the stupidity and the evil. Sad and angry. You probably feel both of those coming out of me right now. <laughs> it's okay. That's part of the process. And they say grown men don't cry. <laughs> Come on. That's a joke. Listen, if you don't agree with this, this is what we're going to be talking about at Central the next few weeks. If you don't have some moments where you allow yourself to be sad, if you don't process this, here's what will happen. Your grief will start showing up in other ways in your life. Right? If you don't go through the hurt, you're going to get lost in the hurt. The way you go through the hurt is you realize big, strong, tough men can still cry. God gave you tear ducts just like he gave women tear ducts. Right? For a reason. It's how we process grief. It doesn't mean the rest of a man. You know? It doesn't mean that you're not, you know, strong and tough and... In fact, you're more secure, I think, as a man when you can cry and let some of your emotions out. Because here's what happens if you don't. Please hear me in this. If you don't have some sadness and some emotion over the next several weeks, in the sense that you bury it and push it to the side, it will show up. It'll start coming out in alcoholism. It'll start coming out in how you numb the pain with addiction. It'll start coming out in anger, just sheer anger towards everybody around you. A lot of the emotional challenges that we go through in our life, especially men, listen to me, are a direct result of the fact that we have grief in our life that we have never been, we've never allowed ourselves to experience it and process it. And so what does it do? It shows up in other ways, right? Destructive ways in our heart and in our life. So we're gonna have seasons where we may be sad and that's okay. And then eventually we're gonna get to acceptance. Acceptance is gonna take some time. Acceptance is just when you get to that place where you say, all right, what has happened has happened. There's nothing I can do to change that. All I can do now is move forward and try to get the most I can out of this grief, try to learn from it, and then try to help others. That's when you know you're moving towards acceptance. And that's going to take some time, and that's okay. This is just a journey we're going to go through. The next couple weeks here at Central, we're going to talk more about that journey, what it looks like, how to process through whatever you're going through, whether this event or something else, and do it in a healthy way so that you go through your hurt rather than get lost in your hurt. Um, but we, we walk through that hurt. What, what does it look like today? A friend of mine named John gave this post, and, and I thought it was pretty powerful. He wrote Still devastated, still confused, still angry, still sad, and still trusting, still hoping, still praying, still planning, still loving, still leading, still believing, still singing, still going. And it's all of that intention, right? We don't give up, we don't quit, we keep moving forward, we keep believing, and yes, we're sad, 
and yes, it hurts, and yes, it doesn't make sense, and yes, we have unresolved questions. That's okay. We take it one day at a time. We walk through the hurt. Here's another principle, and that is to walk in faith. A friend of mine who's been a great friend this week and, and a longtime friend of Lori and I's is Pastor Rick Warren out in Southern California. He was one of the pastors who shared his love on video as the service was uh, beginning. Rick had a son named Matthew who struggled with mental illness. And uh, as an adult, his uh, son took his own life a few years ago. And it was national news, went all over the world. And you can imagine it. People made a lot of assumptions, said a lot of things. And what they didn't know was the backstory of all that this family had tried to do for Matthew. And we knew because Lori and I had prayed for Rick and Kay and Matthew for a long time, as had a lot of people that were friends of theirs. This wasn't a quick journey, right? It wasn't something that just happened. But here's what Rick said after his son Matthew took his life. He said, for 27 years, I prayed every day, 27 years that God would heal the mental illness of my son. Because he lived a very tortured, painful life. His life was not a happy life. It was a painful life. Yet that prayer was never answered. It didn't make sense. We went to the best doctors in the nation. We had the best medications. We had the best therapists. We had prayer. We had healing. We had thousands and tens and tens of thousands of people praying. We have an incredibly strong family, deeply loving, supportive, full of faith. It didn't make sense. He said, I remember after Matthew died, writing in my journal, I'd rather walk with God with none of my questions answered than to walk through life without him and know all the answers. Why, he says, because when you're in the pain, explanations don't help. Whenever you have a major loss, your tendency is to look for a cause, for a reason, or an explanation. So you say, I gotta figure this out. Why did this happen? Why did this person do this? Why did he leave me? Why did I lose my job? Why did I get cancer? Why, why, why? He says, you're looking for an explanation, but explanations don't help. You don't need an explanation. You need God. You need the comfort of God. You need the presence of God. He says, if a loved one were to pass tomorrow and I knew the reason, it wouldn't lessen the pain one bit. More than an explanation, I need God and I need his presence. One day I think we're gonna know the answers when we get to heaven. One day I have to believe things that happen will make more sense. But right now, you and I, we're just kind of on a need-to-know basis. And there's a whole lot I don't know and a whole lot I don't understand. But what I do know is we've got to walk in faith even when we don't understand. And we need the presence and comfort of God even when we have a lot of questions that remain unanswered. We don't need an explanation. We need God's presence and his comfort to get us through this situation. And that's where we walk in faith. Look what David says, Psalm 23, beginning in verse 4. It says, your rod and your staff, they protect and comfort me. It says, you prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. You honor me by anointing my head with oil. My cup overflows with blessing." David says, look, you honor me, you anoint my head with oil. It's probably a reference to when he was anointed as the king of Israel, but it also is a reference to how shepherds interact with their sheep. Philip Keller is a modern-day shepherd, and he wrote about how sheep are tormented by flies. Flies are like the thing that drives sheep crazy. Nasal flies, all these different kind of flies. And nasal flies will come along and they'll plant their larva inside the nose of a sheep where it's nice and moist. Sorry to thoroughly gross you out. And, and you know, and these, these flies hatch. And so you got these flies all around. And he said, look, you get this because I've seen sheep shake their heads for hours and hours trying to deal with these flies and start stomping and they get restless. Some of them in their panic around flies will run and literally kill themselves trying to get away from flies. Flies drive them absolutely crazy. So what does a shepherd do? A shepherd comes along and takes oil and pours it over the sheep's head. And when the shepherd pours the oil over the sheep's head, what happens? All the flies now are suddenly taken care of. He says almost immediately you see the sheep react, begins to calm. 
begins to just settle. And then eventually he says the sheep will go to start eating. And then that sheep will lay down. David says, God, you come and you anoint my head with oil, right? He says, because of you, you renew me. You comfort me with your strength. And I think the idea is, look, we're facing a lot of flies here today. Anxiety, worry, fear, a lot of things coming at us. The biggest battlefield happening this week in a lot of our hearts and minds will be the battlefield of our mind, right? And the fear and the anxiety that we'll all face. And so my hope and prayer for all of us is that we can continue to walk in faith and just allow God to begin to deal with some of that fear and anxiety. Be honest with him about it. Be clear about it. Pray about it. Talk to God about it. It's okay. But then find your strength in God. Settle in him. Find the ability to rest in him and in who he is and walk in faith. Some of you that were at that event, you're going to need some time. And your journey of healing is going to look different than other people's. Some of you that uh, have walked through it with individuals who weren't actually there, you know, your journey is going to look different than others. But for all of us, we've got to keep walking in faith. You know, Friday, I've been to the scene, and, and then Friday, uh, Lori and I have got a few moments, my wife, and, and so we went to Mandalay Bay to grab lunch. And we did that to make a statement. Because we have friends and people that we love that work at Mandalay Bay, and this is, they're, they're victims in this whole thing as well. They didn't, they didn't do this. One guy did this. And I'm not about to let the evil of one guy, right, just destroy so much more than we already have. So we just went to Mandalay Bay to get lunch. A simple thing just to say, you know what, we're not going to let fear win the day. And I want to encourage you too as well. Uh, I sent my daughter, 16 years old, the most precious physical possession in my life to the strip Friday night to a concert. So you're like, you're crazy. <laughs> Why did I do that? Because fear will not win the day. I won't lie, I prayed a little harder, <laughs> right? You know, I sent her out the door like, oh, okay, I feel that in my gut. But we gotta push through that and keep living. And we gotta keep walking in faith. Third way, you, you get through the valley, you walk through the herd, you walk in faith. Third way is you walk together. You walk together. That's why God has placed the church community here. You know, this building, it's interesting, this building that we're sitting in right now, it was originally a quarry, this whole area. And when uh, the Central Church was relocating, they bought this land, it was a quarry, it had to be raised 20 feet so that you could build this building on it, the entire land. And so where do you get that much dirt? It was all part of the discussion and the conversation. You know, you know, if you have to pay for it, you're talking about tens and tens and tens and tens and tens of thousands of truckloads of dirt to get this land up to where it could be built. Thankfully, there was a old hotel called uh, the Hacienda Hotel. It's on the site of current Mandalay Bay property. That hotel was level, and that dirt was all donated to the Central Church to help build this ground up 20 feet across our entire property so that we could build this church building. So I want you to think about this. From the same soil that the worst tragedy in the history of our city has occurred. God had already built his church, the church of Jesus Christ, as the community to shine light and hope and beauty. We walk through this thing together as a church. That's the only way you do it. You do it together. And, uh, and so I want to encourage you to be here over these next several weeks. What we're going to talk about is very important. We're going to talk about how important it is that we deal with our grief. We're going to talk about processing loss, moving towards healing, and whether it's this loss or another loss. Again, I think a lot of the issues that go on in our lives, a lot of the emotional problems, are from unresolved, ungrieved losses. So we're going to talk about what does it look like to deal with those in a healthy way so that we can move forward. If you don't go through the hurt, you'll get lost in the hurt. So we want to go through it. 
And together, here's what David says. He says, surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will live in the house of the Lord forever. And so we hang on to that hope. And we hang on to that hope. Maybe you're here today, maybe you've never crossed that line of faith. I'd love to just give you an opportunity to reach out and trust Christ in your life and receive his forgiveness and mercy in your heart. Would all of you please bow your heads and close your eyes if you'd like to become a follower of Jesus. You begin that journey by repeating after me. You say, dear God, I thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending Jesus into the world. I believe he died on the cross for my sins. I believe he rose again. Forgive me for my sins. Give me the gift of eternal life. Help me face the challenges that I'm up against. God, I surrender my life to you. In Christ. Friends, with every head bowed and every eye closed, if that's your prayer today, if that's your commitment, would you just slip your hand in the air? Acknowledge you're reaching out to Christ today. You make eye contact with me. You just reach out to him today. I bless you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys. I bless you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. God, we love you. We're grateful for each individual just reaching out to you today. And I pray you'll move and work in their heart and life in a powerful way. Fill them with your love and your goodness and your joy. We lift them to you in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to say congratulations to those of you that made a spiritual commitment. And in a few moments when service is concluded, we'd love to put some tools and resources in your hands. Some of you are here today and you're just wondering, like, what can I do, right? How can I get involved? Well, there are some really practical ways that you can get involved, and we've got them out in our lobby. You can just look around. There's some booths there. There's some practical ways you can get involved in direct response to the crisis. A lot of people from around the world have been asking how they can help, how they can jump in. We've listed all of this at, at HopeForVegas.com if you want to go there. You can also give and support financially there, give a gift to help with some of the relief efforts. But you know, we've also, we don't, you don't have to have a crisis to get involved. You know, our city has needs that we've been facing every day. We were facing them last week, and we'll be facing them next week. So here's some of the ways that you can help. Bringing uh, clothes and household items to our donation center to uh, help families who are in need. Bringing food. We're always continuing to stock our food pantry. We have one of the largest food pantries in Southern Nevada helping people out. Uh, you can do that. It's a simple way. Giving a gift financially to help. Jumping in and serving and volunteering, certainly with maybe some immediate things that can happen or with a community organization with what they're doing, but also with many things that are ongoing that are needs in the city. All of that is available to you right out there in the lobby. And so I want to encourage you to check that out uh, as you're leaving. Some of you are here today and you may just need prayer. How do you feel like you can use some prayer, man? It's been a week. Oh, yeah. Here's what I'd love to do with you. We've got uh, our team of uh, pastors and leaders down front here on both sides. And uh, I'm gonna ask Jeff to come on, walk towards me. These guys are gonna spread out down front. And if you would like prayer in your life, wherever you're at, you can just come out when we stand and sing this next song together. Come on down and we would be honored and privileged to pray for you and with you. So would all of you stand together. Let's sing a closing song together. If you'd like prayer, come on down. If you made a spiritual commitment, we'd love to give you a journal and some information. You can also come on down. But I'm just gonna ask you to step out right now and come on down as we sing together. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Don't let go with me. Don't let go with me.
If you made that decision to follow Jesus, it's the greatest decision you'll ever make. And I want to encourage you to come down front because we want to give you something to help you over the next couple of weeks. So make sure you do that. If you need prayer, our team will be down here to pray with you. Don't forget to check out ways that you can get involved in the lobby. And over the next couple of weeks, we're going to be in this series called Vegas Strong. Let's stay in this together. Just as Pastor Jed said, the only way to get through this is together. We need you here. So be back next weekend. But between now and then, remember Romans chapter 8 says, If God is for us, who can be against us?